I think we're going to try and start. Um, and I think we'll start by asking each of us to introduce ourselves. And I'll, I'll start with me. Uh, my name is Bob Kobetsky. I was a principal for 15 and a half years, 13 years of which at, was at City of School High School, if any of you know it, on Houston and 7th Avenue in the South, across from SOB's favorite plans. And I've done a bunch of other things. I'm now at, uh, at the uh, City College uh, Faculty Educational Leadership. I'm Brian Jones, uh, educator and activist in New York City, doctoral student in urban education at the CUNY Graduate Center, and the 2014 Green Party's candidate for lieutenant governor. Of New York. Oh. Okay. We'll, we'll collect your votes now. Right, right. My name is Bill Stroud. I work at Teachers College uh, for the Consortium for Policy Research and Education. Um, I've been a teacher, principal, and district administrator in, in New York City for some years, and I'm going back to principaling in a couple months. I'm going to go to Long Beach High School on Long Island, be principal at high school. So there's a theoretical framework that informs the analysis that we've made of um, the class. Uh, the analysis is what is the nature of the class struggle? How, does it, how is it expressed in the struggle over schooling? Uh, and Bill is going to first present the general theoretical framework, and then I'm going to fill in some of the, um, some of the details. And then Brian will end with um, some additional information. And what our intention is, is to stimulate some thinking. We think our um, way of thinking about um, school, the struggle over schooling and specifically uh, how the class struggle is expressed in the struggle over schooling is, has not appeared in any of the literature and we're hoping that it stimulates some conversation um, both those of you that agree with us, those of you that disagree. What we're really aiming for is to try and figure out where are the leverage points, what are the intervention points for those of us who want to insert ourselves effectively into the struggle in order to defeat um, the uh, increasingly uh, reactionary uh, and uh, almost as far as to say semi-fascist um, attack on public schools. So that's the broad general overview of what we're going to try and do. So I'm going to I'm going to talk a little bit about the general framework, and we would like this to be conversational. So I told Bob and Brian that they may have interruptions or additions to make along the way. I'm going to lay out a, a, a few ideas, and then I'm, I'd like to get some feedback from you. We'll sort of progress in the order we are sitting here at the table, but I'd like it to be back and forth, so I'll do a little mini presentation. We can talk. I'd like to hear your response or pushback or um, additional ideas, and then we'll, we'll move forward. So this, um, our work was really stimulated over the last years in looking at education reform, and we've, we've been involved to some extent directly and indirectly as educators and in some cases working in the policy community uh, with education reform in the last 20 years. And in the critique of education reform, um, what Bob and I started talking about some years ago was that the critique is very responsive to very specific actions and is largely absent a general framework for understanding what the dynamic of economic development is and what we might expect. So the premise that I'd like to present is that um, we can understand that there's a general logic for capitalist development and it when Marx writes about um, capitalism it's uh, it's a synthesis of of 
many capitals ultimately, but there's there's also a dynamic within industries that we've see, seen played out in different economic domains, and that in particular in education over the last 30 years, really, we see sort of that dynamic more explicitly in education reform. And to some extent, um, I'm, I'm not familiar with all of the the critique in the literature, but the literature is largely absent, sort of consideration of what the general tendencies of capitalism are, capitalist development. So I want to talk a little bit about some of those conditions and then the general dynamic or the laws of motion that Marx laid out um, and try to get some feedback from you. So um, we've seen, I think, really that under the guise of school choice, the uh, privatization movement of education and increasingly so organized in a corporate model, but also the investments of, of private monies into the education. I was reading in the last week about, um, there was a CEO of a, a venture capital organization who said this is a trillion dollar forum so public education in the United States is a trillion dollars internationally it's three trillion dollars it's an enormous area where it's been bureaucratized over the last centuries and was largely outside of the domain of, of private interests but We've seen increasing interest in the shifting from public investment under the guise of fees for services where those bureaucracies and offices have broken down in the public sector and they've become increasingly outsourced to private companies. Um, I want to um, so talk about two things. First is sort of what are the conditions that exist under capitalism? Um, in order for markets to exist and economic development, what are those conditions that we see that create the playing field? And then secondly, to look at the general laws of motion, the premise being, sort of I'm asking you to think about with this, is to what extent does an analysis, or Marx's in particular, or sort of Marx's analysis of capitalism, have more explanatory power over the changes that we see in education. And absent um, a direct political opposition to those reforms, what might we expect based on this logic by itself? Absent sort of political opposition to what's happening in education, sort of some mass mobilization, which Brian will talk about later on, is we can expect things to continue in a general direction and have some understanding of that without um, necessarily having to respond. The, the, the specific moments are part of a much larger dynamic. So under capital, um, we have private ownership in the hands of a capitalist class as a central feature that's characterized by production uh, of the sale of commodities for profit. Um, the profit motive being the driving force rather than production for use or production for human needs. And to some extent, we haven't looked at education as a domain of capitalist development because it's apparently outside this sphere of commodity production in the formal sense. Um, but increasingly now, with private investment, so the question is, to what extent does this dynamic get subsumed under the general dynamic of, of capitalism? But another central feature is that the control over production, and in this case, increasing control over the school districts, the schools themselves, either lies directly in the hands of a capitalist class that has particular interests, or their managers that are hired to represent those interests. And increasingly, the work becomes um, outside the domain of the workers themselves. In, um, historically, under capitalism, Marx wrote about this 
the double sense of freedom on the part of the working class. Um, freedom first of workers are freed from the means of production. They no longer have tools in their hands. They don't control the machinery, the ability to reproduce their own lives. They're have their labor power to sell on the market. So they're required, actually, in order to reproduce their physical existence to sell that labor power. So the first sense of freedom is that they're freed of the means of production in a negative sense. And then secondly, they're free to sell that labor power on the market and have control over who, uh, of how they sell it. Um, but increasingly, I think, in schools, we've seen this shift from decisions resting with teachers or having some degree of control over at least the classroom and the practices of the classroom over the last 20 to 30 years to a, a more centralized control <coughs> of, in both management and over the tools of production that people have in the classroom. Um, so a second thing that I, I want to sort of think about is so the extent to which competition is an inherent feature of capitalism, and the extent to which competition exists in the school system with increasing investment. I think what we're seeing is um, as, as charter schools arise, as different publishing houses and service providers um, are, are moving toward a greater market share, you're seeing some competition across these areas. And, and uh, fundamentally, under, under capitalism, the, uh, there's constant technological revolution. So the means of production are being revolutionized in order to make commodities cheaper. They're being revolutionized in order to, what we see is that the machinery of production increasingly has the sort of the process and the product embedded in the actual mach machinery so that in, in schools, there's increasing atten uh, attention to scripting curriculum, to controlling, the workplace through assessments, standardized assessments, through technology, but this constant revolutionizing of technology that we see across industries as industries develop, and more and more of the, the power and the product of production resting in the machinery of production being infused into the technology that's now foisted upon teachers so that teachers increasingly become an appendage to that production process, either through software programs, through standardized assessments, but the, the materials that exist. And what we often hear um, and see in explicit ways is that teachers are interchangeable. They're interchangeable to the teaching and learning that happen. The teaching and learning, the paradigm of teaching and learning rests inside the technology or inside some system of assessment and curriculum and instruction, but as in other industries which develop from, from craft industries where the workers really had fundamental control over the work process into more industrial production, increasingly we're seeing that enter into, in, into schooling so that teachers are interchangeable, they become an appendage to the expectations of the of the technology or the assessments. And as a result of that, um, power is taken over increasingly at the workplace by the technology and by the managerial class, but, but also sort of in the process of production itself, the tendency would be towards removing teachers from having specific control over the day-to-day -day action interactions with students. Um, as a result of um, and I, I understand that most of you have thought a lot about these things, but with the, the, 
the result of the competition of different capitalists, what we see historically, which I think is also likely to be borne out in education, is the centralization and concentration of, of, of the economic domain. So as far as um, we see companies like Pearson or McGraw-Hill, uh, the major publishers have increasing control over, I think Pearson controls the GED now. They've got a common core curriculum. They've been developing standardized assessments for the Common Core and interim assessments. But you're going to see a handful of players and large firms that have control over more and more aspects of the educational process. And we also see at the same time the sort of the concentration of the field. Pearson bought America's Choice, which was a spin-off of the National Center on Education and the Economy. But you're going to see some of these smaller companies get swallowed up by the large firms over time under the guise of efficiency or the ability to provide better services. In fact, what they're doing is standardizing these services. The last few years I've been working internationally and, and I, I see Pearson in Thailand and Jordan and Palestine and Mexico, but you see these same assessments and curricula that are marketed in Britain or here in the United States actually starting to take hold in countries all over the world. Um, I want to just uh, mm, look quickly at general, um, what Marx calls laws of motion of capitalism um, for the purpose of thinking about do these laws actually inform us about what's happened and what we might expect um, in the, in the future in education absent an organized political resistance. So um, one I've alluded to, the constant revolutionizing of the technology and of the education process. Uh, a second is that as things become privatized, privatized capitalists perpetual um, desire to accumulate more capital. So the purpose is initial investment, but taking more out of that investment than they're putting in. How do they make money? This is an area I'm interested in, sort of what the general thinking is here in the room. What are the possibilities for actually extra extracting profit from educational investments? Uh, a third um, um, tendency, again, which a uh, law of motion around the concentration and centralization of capital, which we will see we've seen increasingly um, in education. Um, a, a fourth is sort of the unquenchable desire for capitalists to create more profit. So you have um, all of these areas that were once public domains that now become subject to private investment and figuring out how to extract profit from those investments. Uh, but there are also a couple things that I think are worth pointing out that potentially offer areas for us to pay attention um, to in, in our own work. Um, one is the increasing sort of socialization of labor and the development of the labor process. Um, it, it brings workers together. It, it presents similar conditions um, under under different settings and different contexts. We increasingly, as educators and workers in, in schools, have sort of a common set of conditions that we're subjected to and interests for control over our own work and over, over, the, over the decisions that are made at the workplace. And, and, and an internationalization of this where we can begin to see that the things that affect us as educators in the U.S. are not so dissimilar from the um, conditions that uh, people, teachers in other countries, whether it's Mexico or Canada or Brazil, um, are working are working under, and it allows us an opportunity to have um, common experiences and talk and learn from each other across countries. Um, I think I'm going to stop for the moment. And see if there's any immediate feedback or comments so far, and then we will continue across the page.
I don't exactly disagree with what you said, but in terms of the public becoming private, I think there's a certain racial analysis that's needed since arguably the biggest school reform before all this stuff was desegregation, and the public becomes identified with black and is easily demonized. And I think that's an important part of this process in terms of uh, making things that were assumed when I was coming up, folks would do assumed to be public, except for the most elite people if you went to private schools because you were a screw up in public schools. And so the ability to privatize public, I think it's very important to look at the, uh, the, how the public has become ra racialized and how it's vulnerable to be taken on. I, I, would, I would absolutely agree with what you're saying. I would add to that that Part of what is so frightening about the current trend is that it's an attack on what I would call, what people call the commons. Uh, and because it's an attack on the commons, it has a couple of aspects to it that are scary. One is the racialization of the attack, so that if you look at what schools are closed in New York City, they're predominantly in poor neighborhoods, they predominantly have kids of color who attend them. Uh, and Schools are increased. I mean, New York City has the most segregated schools in the country at the moment, uh, which is uh, an interesting fact in and of itself. And if you look at Bloomberg's uh, reign, uh, you see increasing segregation of schools, and part, part of that consequence of, of closing schools that he said were not functioning well. But the, the attack on the commons um, is an attack on... I would uh, argue an attack on what education, what we think education can be. Um, so it's not just an attack on uh, whether there are public schools, whether there are public libraries, whether there are spaces where public gathers and now it's being privatized, but it's an attack on the way we think about those places, the way we think about education, the liberatory possibilities of education. Schools are one of the few places where kids of different backgrounds can gather, and the fact that we've closed off that possibility, I think, uh, weakens us uh, individually and collectively, and it also suggests that, this, so th this is a kind of interesting thread to follow. Um, so if the way, it, if one of the weapons that's used to attack schools is the hyper-testing regime, one of the things that a hyper-testing regime communicates is that your success is an individual matter. It is not a collective event. And because it's not a collective event, you sever individuals' connections to each other. You reinforce their own belief uh, that you've hammered into them that what they do will be successful or not. And so you've now turned education from being a possibly collaborative, uh, cooperative enterprise where individuals gather and try and figure out what it means to be together into an individual event. And the extent to which that happens reinforces, I would assert, um, the capitalist need to have individual workers who are cut off from their fellow workers. There's a wonderful description of Brahmin's uh, Labor and Monopoly Capital in which he talks about um, the impact of Taylor. Uh, if, if those of you that have read Labor and Monopoly Capital may remember this part, where he talks about Frederick Taylor, the father of scientific management, and he talks about Taylor's interaction with individuals on the shop floor and how Taylor had to figure out a way to sever his own connection, because it came up from the shop floor, to those individuals and their individual connection to each other as the only way he could insert himself into the process and shape that process to his own needs, which were the needs of the owner of the factory. So I, I think that, um, that what Bill has identified is particularly dangerous uh, and frightening for those of us who believe that education can be connected to to being able to figure out who you are in the world, how you want to be in the world, and, and how you're going to be with each other. Um, 
and I want to, yes. I'd like, could I, could I just respond quickly to the comment about, uh, um, I think I agree. I, uh, I'm not sure what all the implications are, but there was um, sort of the, the intersection of race and class is interesting to me here. Um, I wanted to share an experience that I've had the last couple of years. So I, I've done a little bit of work in Chile and followed sort of their education reforms. And some of you probably know that Chile was the experiment in the 80s for Milton Friedman and the Chicago School. And they privatized all kinds of things. When you walk down the streets in Santiago, literally, you can walk three blocks and see five universities, the, these little private freestanding universities. But in the public school system, whereas in, at the end of the 1990s, more than 80% of the students in Chile attended public school. The majority of students now attend school in some kind of portfolio system where they get vouchers or they get money from the state and they have sort of a manager or an educational management organization that runs the school or they have networks of schools. And the smallest percentage of students, I think it's about 20%, actually attend fully public schools. And in those fully public schools, the, those are the schools that with the lowest student performance, with the lowest resources, um, there's no plan in place currently to really attend to the issues of teaching and learning and resourcing of those schools in particular. So while what I heard you say is public is increasingly being defined in particular ways in this country, and there's a um, consideration of race as part of that consideration. Also, uh, at the same time, um, people across the spectrum in the working class are going to be poorly served as a result of these kinds of reforms, I think. Um, you had a comment? Yeah. Uh, so you were talking about schools as a commons, and then on the other hand, you were noticing that individual achievement is at odds with commoning. And so I'm wondering how the privatization of education is, is an attack on the commons, when it seems like schooling has always been over-determined by, um, by class interests and, um, you know, separating the workforce through testing. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it's a great question. So to answer that question, um, I think back to why we are in the position we're in now. Uh, and, um, and I believe that um, the stimulus that led us to where we are now, um, expressed in schooling in the attack, what I would continue to assert is the attack on our common spaces, um, can be found, can best be found in the economic crisis the United States has been experiencing since, since the 1960s. Uh, and specifically, uh, the downturn that occurred in 1973. I don't think it's incident, I mean, this is part of a much larger longer argument, but I'll give you the broad outlines of it. Um, the, it's not accidental that with the downturn in 1973-74, shortly thereafter, one of the first books that appeared that sought to link schooling and uh, the ways in which it was overdetermined by the needs of capitalism was Schooling in Capitalist America, Bowles and Gintas. Uh, and even though I would argue that it was, and other people have argued that it was overly deterministic um, and somewhat simplified, what followed after Bowles and Gintas was a host of other kinds of writings that sought to unpack schooling in, and its impact on individuals' lives. Uh, and that almost parallels what was happening economically and what I believe was happening be great to have somebody push back against this, um, is 
that um, there were cyclical crises that capitalism was subjected to beginning in 1973. If you look at the late 1960s, there's a um, downward trend of profitability that has occurred in U.S. industry since 1960s, late 1960s, continuing up to the present era. Uh, and um, so there are two aspects of that that I can been able to figure out. One aspect is the need for, I mean, as Bill has identified, Capitalism is about making profit. So you don't just have money lying around. You want to have money somewhere where it'll make money, right? That's the whole point. So where does money make money? Well, you, there are only two places. You can invest it in your country. But increasingly in the United States, that was difficult to find places for profitable investment. Or you can invest it overseas. It's not accidental that the United States then engaged in a series of overseas adventures which were disguises for um, their investment needs, um, whether in Southeast Asia or in other parts of the world, Latin America. I mean, there's something like, I saw a statistic the other day, there's something like 75 discrete interventions that the United States has engaged in around the world since the 1960s. I mean, that's a bizarre number. But if you think of every time the United States sent an invasion force into another country, it was to secure that country for capitalist investment. So that's one aspect. But because that became increasingly closed off for a bunch of other reasons, it then turned, capitalists then turned uh, internally to look for places where it could put its money. And so where do you invest your money? You invest it in places that are held publicly. If you can privatize places that help publicly, they then become available for private investment. And I would argue that schools became available for private investment. So while I think you're right, schools has always been overdetermined by the needs of capitalism. And that's because schooling was and is an institution that is linked to the needs of capitalism. We create kids who fulfill the needs of capitalism. But also, um, we look to invest money, to make money, and where do we invest money? Um, charter schools have turned out to be enormously profitable for investors. The new uh, markets tax credit scheme, which was passed on the Clinton, which, by the way, is an interesting uh, study. The new markets tax credit scheme was passed in specifically to stimulate investment in low-income neighborhoods. It was not passed to benefit charter schools, but charter schools invest in low-income neighborhoods. Charter school investors can double their investment in seven years using new market tax credits. That's an absurd statistic. But there's there's one more sort of... I, I, I think we've entered sort of a new era in the sense that while, yes, schools historically have been subject to the class interests of the ruling class, um, but um, previously there was some notion of sort of the state or government, at least ideologically, having some role to protect, protect the common good or to look out for community interests and that um, over the last 30 years, the role of the state has been increasingly defined as protecting the free market or allowing for free exchange or a free marketplace. So there's no longer some, there, there was previously, and in the Department of Education, we had this for years, this bureaucracy that to some extent protected sort of the school system for better or worse. Uh, against any direct political involvement. So you had some kind of bureaucratic um, barricade that these kinds of policy decisions didn't impact schools in the same way, whereas now, both through redefining sort of what the role of the state is, but also to allow private monies directly into the public sphere, I think sort of what my point I'm trying to get at is that there's an economic dynamic that we would be well served 
to pay attention to sort of what are those laws of motion of capitalism because we're going to be subjected to that increasingly absent and organized political movement. Yeah, um, I guess I, I just wanted to make explicit, I guess, one thing you sort of alluded to, and that's that the one can see the increasing control of school curricula and standardized tests as, an increase, as a direct application of Taylorism, taken from the factory to increase the efficiency of production and control of production to at schools as workplaces. But the, the other thing it does is it affords capital control. So that's control both of the, the labor force produced and ensuring the army of unemployed specific of specific types and it controls the uh, the content of, of what capital can make from education into propaganda so it, it, I mean it controls you know but there's a race element but there's a class element and it can, just controls the, the proportion you know there have always been vocational schools and public school systems but they can turn more of them into vocational schools by this way. But in addition to just taking the private into the, the commons as a source of profit, it, it also lets it exert control by creating more educational debt, both on the individual level and on the city level. And that debt bo is both a source of profit and population control. So. Yeah, um, I, I think the difference, the way I would describe the difference is in, in the way schools is that before they were integrated into a capitalist economy and now they're subject to capitalist logic. That's, that would be the transition in the period you're describing. You know, in terms of, I don't know much about Chile. I know a little bit about Vietnam and education. And part of the way the privatization comes in is a critique of the prior socialist efforts and that, that there's some more accountability in the free market there. So, you know, I, I didn't say race was the only dynamic. Yeah. yeah but it, yeah. but I think in America, it's, it's the it's key dynamic. Right. Um, right. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's, and, and I didn't mention in some other remarks, it has to do with how you're dealing with increasingly marginalized populations as well. And so the social control aspect that you're referring to comes into greater play as well. I just add a couple of other ways. I think, by the way, everything that we've said here is right on the money. But I, because I, I think about Marx a lot when I think about you know every form, and I see a couple other things. I mean, the ideological reproduction of workers and their competitiveness, the commodity production of the worker as a commodity, and all that. But I see primitive accumulation too, which in some ways is for me the most powerful aspect of Marx analysis. And if you look at how these every formers are getting their will done, it's through dictatorial means. Everywhere. It's may world control in Chicago and in New York. It's state control in New Jersey. Who knows, you know, how it is in other states that we just it's it's Katrina flood, you know, disaster, you know, capitalism in New Orleans. It's all dictatorially done though. And it's quite literally taking people's stuff. Yeah, that's it's taking the public stuff and handing it over to private yeah. interests. Yeah. And yes, yeah. as I've had argued to me by charter school advocates. Oh, they're non-profits, the charter schools. But as you pointed out with the new markets tax credit, they're not. And I think, actually, that the privatization is going to go through phases. Like, it's not happening with the snap of a finger, except in maybe New Orleans it might be happening faster than we can imagine. But I think it's going through phases where there will be a time where there will be, like, non-profit portfolio-type schooling. And then, after that becomes, like, the majority or maybe 80 70% of all schools, like in Chile, perhaps, then you can go to full-on privatization, and suddenly poor parents will just be like, oh, shit, I have to pay a $2,000 tuition bill? Where did that come from? I think it may take 10 to 20, even 30 years, but I think that's the logic of, of capital, as you described it, and as I think Marx would describe it. I think it perfectly mirrors, or, or the every form perfectly mirrors it in even more ways than we're describing. It's an interesting sort of the primitive accumulation idea of coercion or the initial coercion to break yeah. down whatever social yeah. bonds and different forms of production that existed, I think, is, makes a lot of sense. 
to your question. You said that schooling was um, subject to capitalism now, and you used a word before. What was the word that you used? Integrated. Integrated? Yeah, if you don't know what school is, integrated. schools were supposed to integrate you into capitalist society, but they themselves didn't work by an internal capitalist mm -hmm. logic. And I think what is being described here is that's what's happening now. And maybe for the last generation, that's when the process really got on. Does that make sense? When did schools not... Um, Sorry, when did schools not run with capitalist logic? Uh, I, 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 I don't want to go back and forth, but I would say the period he's describing in the early 70s is where that really gets momentum. So prior yes. to that. Um, I'm a labor historian, so I'm obviously very interested in this issue of class analysis of you know, the struggle over schooling. Um, I have a couple of concerns, though. And one of those concerns is if we think of schools and teachers in an overly productionist kind of context, we miss something larger, which is teachers are not, you know, assembly line workers. They're not turning out cars. They're engaged in an effort which connects them to communities. And what I fear or am concerned about is that we take an overly narrow economic approach to thinking about schools and how they function. We lose we have a tendency, I think, to think about political responses very much in a narrow kind of trade union way, whether those trade unions are you know, radical, even revolutionary industrial unions, or much more conservative ones like we saw in New York City over the last 40 or 50 years. And so my concern is teachers always need to remember, and their unions need to remember, that they've got a connection to the, their products, which is their students, and the, and the parents in the communities in which those schools are based. And if we lose that, if we overly stress the economic, I, I fear that we have a tendency to, to lose that other connection. Yes. I have another concern that is, is related to what we have been saying. For 40 years, I'm working as an industrial, in, in industry, manufacturing. And what I see is a breakdown in know-how. We are losing the know-how. In 10 to 15 years from now, I can assure you, we will not know how to make aeroplanes and tanks, which is a good thing. But we may not know how to make spoons, forks, essential things for our survival. And somebody else probably at the other end of the world will say, OK, if you need a spoon, use your fingers. Sorry. Back to the caves. Yeah, I, there's a, I hate to reference Braverman again, but because uh, it's such a powerful book, there's a, there's a part of where Braverman talks about the impact of uh, Taylorism on the production process itself and what we lose by being, by uh, the assertion of Taylorism over the production process, losing the memory of how to make certain, it's a great point, yeah. Um, I wanted to, to also see if this is controversial, uh, make, a, make a slightly different point about the impact of all of this on um, how the package that, I, that is being sold um, to kids of color and poor kids. Um, the argument that uh, college is necessary for kids I won't argue it's not, uh, but it serves the purpose of capitalists to argue that. Uh, we know that something like 89% of kids who go to public universities leave public universities in debt, and not an insignificant, 89%. So why do capitalists want so many kids going to college? We know that uh, most jobs don't require college. We know that the skill level that's demanded uh, by most manufacturers is not college level. Um, I would assert that they, that they want so many people going to college in order to create a reserve army uh, that they can draw on and cheapen the labor process. And what seems to be happening economically is a kind of bifurcation now. We have a small number of people who are 
are very skilled, who have high paying jobs, and a much larger number of people who have low skills and don't even make enough money to clear the poverty level. 89.3% of the people who live in New York City make 150% of the poverty wage. 49.3%. We don't usually experience them. We don't usually see them. They're kept hidden from view, and I think that's all incredibly deliberate. And frankly, it's dangerous. Uh, what was the number again that you said? 49.3%. Of, of making one hundred and fifty. Make one hundred and fifty percent of the poverty wage. I, I would, I think of that debt as an application of the debt model that long been applied to developing countries for control, to you know both as control and as a source of profit, to applying that to an increasing number of poor people. So that you know previous, I mean this is a function of public education not being fully funded. So that previously, you know, it's not that. They're pushing more people to go to college, but those who go to college, you know, there were previously city and state universities were better funded and people would come out with less debt. Less debt. Now they exert more debt there that both exerts control and profit. Well, the other thing is that the colleges they're trying to push kids into are increasingly dumbing down vocation. Like, so, for instance, our superintendent is constantly talking about all kids must be college ready. And first of all, that's absurd because no nation in the history of Earth has ever come anywhere near even 50%. I don't think we're pretty close to 30, 30s or something like that. But the point is, then these colleges, they're barely high school. Like some of the colleges in New Jersey around Newark, you know, Newark, New Jersey has some great universities, Rutgers, Princeton, blah, blah, blah. But then it also has a lot of very low level that are barely above high school. And you almost wonder, like, whether it's a giant ruse just designed to con people and keep them running on the hamster wheel and keep them competing desperately rather than developing the collective self, you know, in the commons. Yeah, that, absolutely. You know, more than 40% of Americans who start college don't get a degree in four years. And if you include community colleges, it's over 50%. Uh, and the one correlate to whether you graduate or not is what your parents' income was. So um, I'm agreeing with you. I think that we are creating this mythology which serves the needs of capitalism and doesn't serve the needs of people. And in serving the needs of capitalism, interestingly, what happened, I mean, I see this in my own students at City College, I'm sure you see it at Brooklyn College, Kids end up blaming themselves for their own failure. When I was a principal in New York City, when kids didn't do well, they blamed themselves. They're not the ones who are failing. It's us who failed them. And I don't mean individually, I mean collectively. Uh, and the fact that we flipped uh, the explanation so that the arrow of blame is pointed to the individual and then the person you know, takes that on as their own burden is part of what serves capitalism to disguise what the workings of the system are so that, I mean, if, you, if individuals can believe that they are to blame and that the system somehow is not at fault, then the system is protected. Um, since unions were alluded to, I guess another thing to make explicit is that this assault on public education very directly has an intent to weaken the power of and break public unions. I mean, the shift towards uh, charter schools to divert money away from public education is to decrease the number of people with unions, the power of unions, and that's not accidental. The last public school closed in New Orleans. New Orleans has no more public schools. They are all charter schools. That's probably the canary in the mine for us. Certainly, if you look at the, the upward trend in New York City, uh, it, what's the projection? I think the projection is something like 12,000 seats for next year, that in addition going to charter schools. And now, charter, now New York City Department of Education has to pay 
for the space that charter schools will occupy. Talk about redistribution of money away from uh, public redistribution. So I, now that we've <laughs> I'm just sitting here trying to figure out how to enter into this conversation. There's so much at stake here and so much at play. Um, well, let me say a few words since I haven't said anything yet. Um, the first thing I want to say is, which may surprise people, is in defense of Bulls and Gintas. I actually recently reread the book. And I think people should read it for themselves. Because what is said about it, I found not to be true. In particular, they don't actually view schools as just like other workplaces. Actually, they are very attentive to the uniqueness of school as a workplace and as a, as a place where something special is going on under capitalism. And the way they describe it is as an unequal contest. That working people go into school for our own reasons, mainly to get out of our situation, try to change it, and they, wealthy, power of the elites, enter into shaping schooling for their reasons, mainly to keep us where we are. And so that fundamental contradiction in what we, these two groups, are trying to do in school is what shapes school struggle. And it is a contest, and they describe it in a very much more dynamic way than people give them credit, as a contest, albeit an unequal contest. And they actually, they also, they're charged with being economistic or you know, overly focused on the economic aspect, but actually there's quite a lot of discussion in the book about the unique histories of particular social groups in America who go from being kind of social pariah to trying to become included in American society, trying to fight to break into public education. And in particular, not only various immigrant groups, but African Americans in particular, in the unique history of African Americans struggling to get into the school. And that leads us in many ways, as you pointed out, to our current moment where it's the very public, now that they broke it in, the very public nature of schooling is being ripped apart. And in some cases, they were able to go to parents. I was a teacher in Harlem for eight years. They were able to go to parents and say, to help this public school business, we've got a better thing for you. And certainly not everybody, but there was a chunk of, there were a chunk of parents who had an ear for that argument. We're willing to enter into that bargain because what's the use of the public school when my child is being mistreated, when the teacher doesn't believe my child? You know, all the horrible experiences that we know people, you know, it's not shocking that in a racist society people might have an experience with racism in the school, that the school would reproduce that. So I'm not one of the people who believes that the way capitalism enters into schooling is just about immediately making profit. That is a kind of new, unique thing they're trying. Not, and actually, as you, as you, as others, you and others pointed out, the Taylorism, the trying to, trying to make the relationships of schooling mirror the relationships of the factory, that's old too. That's been going on for a long period of time. They've been trying, oh, a hundred years. They've been on an attempt to try to factorize, you know, our relations in school. I think what Gintis and Bowles remind us, though, is that we cannot be satisfied even with, I think, what we would right now in our circumstance consider a massive victory. Were we to protect the public nature of schooling, the obligation to provide all of these rich services to people at no charge, just for walking through the door, you know, that's being ripped up, but were we to protect that? Were we to get smaller class sizes and really rich curricula and free college education all the way? I mean, all of the things that we're demanding, if, even if we were to win all of those things, that we should still remain in a state of dissatisfaction with those. Because still, as long as we're living in this society, it's not us who determine whether or not you'll even be able to get a job with all of those degrees and certificates or what your actual conditions of life will be. That they can change what the qualifications are, you know? How many people with how many degrees have made applications to Starbucks? One could do a study. That certainly there's a lot about this society that is not within our control. And often one of the patterns Bowles and Gintas point out is they'll give us educational reform in 
place of giving us the more fundamental changes that we all desperately require. In place of universal health care, they'll give you a chance at getting a certificate. In place of raising the minimum wage, they'll give you a chance at continuing on with your education. That's part of, so that opens up opportunities for us to fight for and win things in education, but it also creates problems for us in that we, um, you know, we don't fully control schools and their relationship to society. So I, I think that we, we are in a particular moment now where the question of, with a particular form of capitalism's attack on schooling or capitalism, what capitalism is trying to do in schooling has a unique form now, right at this moment, that calls upon us to defend the public nature of schooling. Not because that will be liberation, but because that will change, shift the balance of forces in this country in our favor. They want us, they want to set us up so that we don't deserve anything. You get nothing for living, you're just for breathing, just for walking around, you don't deserve health care. You don't deserve anything. The only things we'll give you are things we'll give you through some kind of stingy market mechanism. They won't give us universal health care, they give us, uh, you know, uh, whatever, the Obama plan where you can, you know, buy using your shopper power, uh, collective shopping for, for a private health insurance, hopefully you'll get a reduced rate. You can't get free college, but we'll give you more information about taking out a college loan so you can be a better shopper for college loans. Everything, we won't fix climate change, but we'll create a market in credits of pollution. I mean, everything is through a stingy market mechanism. You don't deserve any of these things, and we won't give them to you unless you can pay for them as a shopper in the market. And No Child Left Behind constructs parents, no longer as citizens empowered with rights to change and improve their school, but as shoppers. You don't like your school, you're free to leave. And look, for some people, that is going to feel like an improvement. That's the trick of this thing, is that because of the history of racism and mistreatment in the schools, for some people will experience privatization as an improvement. They'll go from a public school, where they're very dissatisfied, to a charter school that's better, or at least a better experience. They'll the, the being liberated from their school and being able to shop for a school will be an improvement for them. They'll experience it. I know some teachers who experience the Common Core as an improvement. It's better than the standards that came before. So I, I, we just have to be able to understand and relate and speak to that experience. Well, I think sticking to our guns, that what is happening now with privatization is actually ripping away rights from us. And rights, once given up, are very difficult. think it is uh, an improvement? No, I don't I, think it's I, an improvement. I'm just saying some people will experience it that way. I think that there are a handful, but the other thing that happens is sort of the advertising that begins to go into the, the marketplace and the, sort of the, the control over public ideas and consciousness about what's good for the public. It, I think that there's been very little success with the charter school with the whole privatization, and you're, you're right, Brian, I'm not disagreeing with that point, but increasingly sort of in the media what we read about is sort of these, the, the failures of the public system, which indeed was a failure for many communities, um, but the alternative is going to be more of a failure. I think you have two questions. Uh, one, has anyone ever heard of an economistic explanation for the racial integration of schools in the 60s? I'd be curious to hear if there is one. And um, the other, I wonder if anyone would speak for the, um, the no testing movement, the protest testing. Like, I, whenever I hear that um, there's a new plan to um, improve education, improve the improve our test scores. I always think that if the test scores improved, they would just rewrite the tests so that um, you have more of a separation again. It seems like a false argument of political football, drive out the voters, uh, a fake um, a fake ploy to the voter. I want to try and answer the second question you asked about uh, the, the no testing movement. Um, you know, like like every opposition to what to the to what exists, uh, it, it's very mixed. Um, there is a movement in New York City um, called the Consortium for 
it, it is a group of 28 schools that came together and got from Tom Sobel um, permission not to give tests. And because I think Brian is right, everything is a kind of double-edged sword, and we have to be careful that we don't wish for what we don't want because we're fighting for something we do want, and then we get something we don't want. So the, the consortium has a portfolio system. Uh, the only exam kids have to take is the English exam. Uh, but is anybody from a consortium school here? No, okay, so deputize all of you and swear you to secrecy. It'll probably come as no surprise, but the, there is great variability in the content of those portfolios and probably in the content of the educational experience kids have. Nonetheless, uh, my daughter, 10-year-old, 11-year-old daughter, is going to a consortium school next year uh, because I believe that um, we have to actively oppose testing, uh, which has a terrible impact on kids, on their psyche, on the way in which they think about themselves, what they think about each other, uh, and the ways in which they interact with each other. The fact that teachers refer to kids as a, as a level two, kid doesn't have a name, I mean, there's all kinds of implications for education being caught, caught up in that kind of trap. Um, but I think we need to be careful, as I think Brian was pointing out, that um, I guess the question, and maybe it's a question for you also, you know, if, if the um, reason all of this is happening, lies in the fundamental economic system of the United States. We can't all sit around and wait for the revolution. But what do we do in the meanwhile? And if we start nibbling at the fringe, do we risk um, believing that what we're nibbling is actually the meal, uh, forgive the analogy, or that we really are making progress because 28 schools in New York City of enormous variability in quality, uh, both in the content of the experience kids have in school as well as uh, how they represent that in their portfolio is somehow a victory. Uh, and how do we build on that in order to really attack the fundamental reason that education is being pulled to other purposes. I don't have answers to that. I'm just wondering how we begin to piece together a movement and where the leverage points are to affect change. Well, I want to say something about that. I, I think there's something unique about this attack on public education in that it pisses off all the people that we need to organize together. It pisses off students makes them hate school more, it closes their schools, lays off their teachers. It really angers and frustrates parents. And of course, there's a huge, heavy element of attacking teachers and especially unionized teachers. The corporate privatizers have played quite brilliantly upon the social and historic divisions between those groups, especially in their wrapping themselves in the robes of racial justice and civil rights. And I think we have an opportunity now to make connections between those different groups and, and argue along similar lines. But that requires desegregating our movement. It requires making the kinds of alliances with parents and communities that are not just transactional, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch yours, that are not just alliances at the top among organizations in that sense, but genuinely grassroots. Um, and we have very few models for how to do that. One of the few, or, or the few that are popping up, I, are very important to look at. And I would draw your attention to the Chicago Teachers Union. I would draw your attention to the recent contract negotiated in Portland, where the Portland Teachers Union also, basically, even though their contract, what they're allowed, in both cases, what they're allowed to negotiate with their contract really had very little to do with what they said in the media, with what their campaign was about. You would have thought the Chicago teachers were negotiating about air conditioners and class size um, when they were allowed to negotiate about no such thing. And actually, they won some of those things. They won air conditioners. 
They want books on the first day. They want more uh, nurses and guidance counselors. They want things that they campaign with community members for, even though it wasn't uh, a question of bargaining, strictly speaking. But because they tapped into what it was that parents and students wanted and used their union muscle to fight for those things in the public forum, they actually ended up winning them, and uh, arguably they got a better contract. Same thing in Portland, where you know the students who have whose schools are deemed the most failing, the you know the trouble kids who who are at the bottom of the you know the grading system. It was those schools that were the most organized, ready to do walkouts for uh, a teacher strike. So you had a, a situation in which you could, you know, the media went around to Portland high school students and they were like, yeah, we got a good contract. It's like they viewed it as their contract. And that's an amazing achievement given the rips. But it requires a conscious orientation on the idea of uniting these disparate forces and understanding the special nature of, uh, of, uh, of the opportunities created in a school environment for bringing people. is that um, teacher training programs are now becoming privatized. Mm -hmm. So the ed TPA um, is now standardizing teacher portfolios and outsourcing that so that teachers now are graded upon someone who's being contracted who has no idea about education, who's just following literally a rubric. And so in a moment where we need really strong, critical, critically engaged teachers, that's also, there's a huge backlash coming on teacher training programs. And I know I'm in part of a teacher training program in Vermont. In Vermont, uh, Board of Education is actually like coming to the teacher programs and asking like, if we don't put forth an alternative, we're gonna have to sign under Pearson. Mm -hmm. So it's really important if people are connected with teacher training programs um, to be aware of this fight. And I think it's already passed in I want to say they're trying it out in about 35 states now. Pearson is the world's largest educational publisher. And really quickly, so I, I um, Pearson uh, in New York State has the contract to, teachers have to take the educational teacher preparation uh, test, and Pearson has the contract to develop it to administer it, it also, surprise, surprise, has the contract to produce the professional development materials so people know what it, what's in the content of those tests. They run workshops where you can go and learn what is on the tests. They then will produce pre-test material where you can evaluate your students and see where they uh, need, where the gaps in their knowledge are so that you can remediate, forgive the expression, so uh, my college sent me up to Albany to sit in on a Pearson program uh, and take the EdTPA. Uh, and um, I can tell you two things about that experience. One is that uh, the vast majority of questions that were on the test had little to do with any knowledge that one could use in the classroom to try and figure out how to respond to the students uh, who were in front of them. And when uh, a number of us asked questions about what the, um, what studies they had done regarding validity, uh, the Pearson person uh, pushed that off as being an irrelevant question. Uh, and by the way, New York State Regents has never ever released the validity studies. So we don't know that the New York State Regents have any validity. What does that mean? It's also true for the National Teachers Exam or all of those mechanisms. Yeah. Oh, yeah, hi. Um, I'm Julie Willebrand, and I'm so glad. I, I got here late, so I didn't think I wanted to say anything because I didn't know what you already said. So I am okay. so delighted to hear what I have heard because but among other things, everybody should know that Pearson is Murdoch. And we all know what a villain Murdoch is at every level. 
it's his company. <laughs> that, he, that they turned it over, that the education system at the highest level in New York handed the system to, to Pearson, to Murdoch, is pretty outrageous. But the question, uh, by the way, uh, what I want to know, and I hope I hear from you, is what has happened to the teachers' colleges in the country? I'm a graduate of Teachers College at Columbia, um, and one of those people that got a free education in those days from Teachers College. Uh, we learned about, and my dissertation was in testing, that validity was the first and most important concept. Does this test measure what you claim it's going to measure? You go take a driver's test, and what do they make you do? Drive. So none of these tests do anything other than work off reliability. That's the second concept. And that means multiple choice. Because then you rely, you get a reliable answer. I decided this was the right answer, and if you didn't give me this one, it's the wrong answer, no matter what. And that's what it's operating on. It's hard to believe that the, I, I know about the state of New York, I don't know about the other states, that the state of New York has now turned its education system over to a corporation and a corporation dedicated to profit and dedicated, I want to be able to do this on a multiple choice basis because it's cheap. It's very expensive to go and ask people to write essays and then grade, grades and so forth. So we've got a system running on this monster with no validity. There's no evidence to support multiple choice as the way to determine whether or not a kid can write or reason or speak. So <laughs> sorry for a rant, but I'd love to hear more about what you think about nationally. Where are the teachers' colleges in this? Why are they not right up there front with us? I don't ever see them saying anything. I guess it depends on corporate donations to their Especially now that they have, now that their presidents have to get millions of dollars in in, in CEO compensation. Uh, I thought it was very interesting for me what you're saying about the the recertification and educational testing for teachers because I mean I, I don't do that directly but it's exactly what's being done now for physicians and nurses and physician assistants. There, there are privatized companies that require recertification every X years. There are modules one has to do for a fee. You know, and, and I, I think it's worth thinking about because these things can be spun in the media and made to sound good. Well, of course you would want your physician to be up to date. But these tests have not been validated in any sense. You do these little modules and pay a fee and you get a certificate. And if you don't pay the fee, now this can be posted on websites that you're not current. And this is all done under the guise of, of publicly accessible, useful information when there's no validation that it's any of that at all. And it's not like going to, for your, to get your, it's not like going to the, to get your driver's test and having to drive again. And it's not by a government service. It's all a privatized fee. So it's just another venue for profit and and control, I guess. Well, I came late, even later than Felicity was in. Uh, but uh, probably, I assume, that you have talked about also content. What kind of content should be taught to the students and to the teachers? Because the teachers are going to transmit what they do. We haven't talked about that. Okay, so, so you can talk about it. I, I'm talking yeah. the, yeah. the question. So, for everybody, let's talk about content. What, what is the how? Let me concern with content also, and more important than anything else, I guess. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll talk about that too. I, I, I am scared to death by the insidiousness of the, 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 the corporate entry into the like, teacher training because I think like I have a friend who just finished a master's he said all they taught me was the same shit I hear from my administrators who are all corporate you know with Cami Anderson in New York people like the corporate education reform was taking over those teachers colleges as well and it's the best of them and at state schools of course you know they need money and as governors cut their budgets then of course they go to Johnson and Johnson or they go to some other corporation for their funding so it becomes more privatized in that way 
But then, even at the biggies, like Johns Hopkins has some guys doing research telling us how this data disproves this. And, you know, at Credo in, at Stanford, of course, which is basically a right-wing think tank for, for yes. the, the corporate reformers. Um, so I think that's very insidious. And then on content, they're pushing the content, too. They're saying, we need more science and math education, more science and math. As a history teacher, I think we need more history. <laughs> we elected George Bush president. That means we know no history whatsoever. <laughs> like, and, and we think the Democrats are good, which also means we know no history. <laughs> so the reality is, I mean, we're, they're deprioritizing the stuff we desperately need to know to be good human beings and citizens. And they're prioritizing the stuff we need to know to be good, compliant workers who know some technical skills and we're good little technocrats. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. they, they look at what we're facing. This is a, I'm paraphrasing a line from a friend of mine who led a, a test boycott recently in Seattle, Jesse Agopi. He said, look at what young people are facing today. Climate change, the greatest gap between rich and poor ever in the nation's history, seemingly endless wars, including drone assassinations. The idea that Pearson has the answers to any of that is absurd and ridiculous, and yet that's the way we're bringing up a new, new generation. It's like it's not about asking questions; it's about answering it according to the way they think. So, so there's no way that they that the way they're trying to set us up is to prepare students to grapple with these things. That's a huge problem. I think there's also a lot of concerns about the way that the skills-oriented curriculum being pushed further and further down into the early grades actually gets rid of the kind of intellectual development that we know uh, young people need to go through, like free play. And so you have, you know, when you start administering standardized tests to four and five year olds, then that means you can't have dress up time, you can't have, you know, play, um, and kind of free imaginative play, which is the work of childhood. So there's a lot of uh, problems with this. One last piece is just, I don't know if people have seen these, uh, David Coleman is one of the architects of Common Core, has these videos out about teaching, you know, Common Core aligned curricula. And so he talks about letter from Birmingham jail and how to do a close reading of a letter from a Birmingham jail. He talks about uh, the Gettysburg Address and how to do a close reading. And his whole argument is that you should not give kids any context. That this has to be a deep contextualized understanding of the text. You read it closely and use the clues to figure it out. But the problem is that we all read, but that's not how any of us read in real life. If we read something closely, it's because, well, I'm going to read this rent agreement because I'm going to have to pay the freaking rent every Wait a minute. You know, you read something closely if it matters to you. The Gettysburg Address matters because he's standing in a field of dead bodies. That's why That's why somebody would pay close attention to what it is that Lincoln is saying. The Birmingham, the letter from Birmingham jail is written in jail. And why he's in jail matters to understand the context. The context matters. But the decontextualized analysis of text matters to them because that's what you need to do to take a test. You flip the page and there's a decontextualized passage and now you answer questions, and you flip the page, and it's out of context, a whole different passage about something totally different. And not uh, taking away the context takes away the danger of these social questions. And here he picked two very danger, two moments of extreme social change and challenge, the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement, and then tried to take away all the danger from, from the study of, of its history. Coleman, Coleman, I believe, is the CEO of College Board, too. So that's right. right. He's all the... All the tests are leading up to the test that gets you out of high school. Well, you know, this is in law. I mean, my workshop today is on a counter commemoration to the Pentagon's 50th commemoration of the Vietnam War. And on our website, we actually have a K 12 unit plan to teach it differently. But this is, I mean, the, the war is about hero and valor, and they're penetrating public schools with that content. It's one of their main goals. So it's just an example. Uh, and, and, you know, this is something that marked my generation's life pretty deeply. And it's totally decontextualized and put in this trial. It'd be interesting to see how successful they are to put the Vietnam War in a triumphal narrative. But you know, they've done that with the civil rights movement to a large extent. So, so the, you know, the, the schools and the larger society and the content there is very if anyone's interested in that, I have some flyers on my website. I wonder if this fight has to be fought on 
two totally opposite levels. Uh, I, we've been dusting off our old books, and I just reread Teaching as a Subversive Activity. Um, and, and more than ever, I think, teaching is a, needs to be a subversive activity. Um, and, and so I, I think at the teacher uh, certification level, uh, where I think by and large faculty are totally opposed to this uh, regimentation agenda, and I think that's the greatest fear, um, uh, to, to more or less ignore, or at least teach beyond the common core, to teach beyond uh, NCAPE and CAPE, which are our two big accrediting organizations that came even before NTBA, which is a regimenting kind of, um, of uh, uh, requirement. Um, and at the same time, fighting at the macro political level, I'm not sure how much it really does, but uh, changes in the mayoralty in New York City, in, in Newark, uh, I, I think really make a difference. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it should be said that somewhere along the line, the right wing and the left wing are coming together in opposition to this regimentation. So uh, I, I just wonder about your responses to um, how this really can be fought. And, and in fact, I think one, as, as successive generations of, of reforms have sort of taken place and failed because teachers and parents just wouldn't go along with whatever that new curriculum was, what, whatever that new requirement was coming down from the state. Um, and at the same time to, you know, sort of jujitsu move use the very decentralization of American education, which in many ways is, is the enemy because it creates these tiny enclaves, and even at the charter school level, uh, to say, you know what, there, there are places where even progressive charter schools are possible to break the uh, corporate monopoly that's occurring over the, the districts. Okay, so who's going to take that? <laughs> Easy question, right? Well, I'll, I'll start at sort of the most practical level, because I was thinking about your question also. So I'm going to go back and be a principal exactly. this fall. Good question, um, And what I was, as I was listening, what I was thinking about, I didn't know if it was sort of a, an appropriate question, but um, there are periods of time resistance is about the best that we can do. Uh, and we're talking a lot about resistance, but we don't have an alternative vision, or at least we're not articulating an alternative vision about what schooling can be or education can be, either sort of at the school site or in the larger community in, in, in public schooling. Um, so I was thinking about your question about content. I'm not sure I understand it. But it, it's striking to me that we send students out of secondary school um, and sort of willy-nilly or happenstance or not at all being able to think deeply and analytically about um, climate change, the reduction of biodiversity, ecological sustainability, um, issues of domination and oppression and the nation state across ethnic groups, but the kinds of things that are fundamental to the quality of life, whether we live here or in other countries, and nowhere are they, at least in my knowledge, directly addressed as part of the public school curriculum in order to be able to think about graduating potentially powerful adult citizens out of high school. So one thing I would like to do is I want to address the content issue. I think that we need to think carefully about what are those issues that are fundamental to the quality of life, to what extent is there academic content embedded in those, and let's develop curricula that directly allow students better understandings of those things and the possibility of acting 
in our communities around some of these issues in ways that um, are practical. That's not just a theoretical undertaking. So, so that's one area that I'm interested in. The second thing is, and um, is sort of, what does democratic decision making look like at the school site? How do how do we engage not uh, uh, faculty, students? Also, what's the nature of the relationship between, we're, if we're a community school, what's the involvement of the community? How are we involved in the community? How is the community involved in, in school? And what's the nature of decision making and, and some kind of democratic process that we can exercise at the school site? So I don't mm, assert that any of these things are particularly grand, but those are two areas that I've been thinking about starting this fall. Hi, uh, my name is John Braden. I'm proud to be a radical, radical English teacher. Uh, I did my student teaching at City as School, and I just recognize Bob Lubetsky now, so I know where my roots come from. Uh, I just finished a book called Teaching Under the Radar, Confessions of a Secret Agent of Change. So my concern now is surviving in authoritarian places. I'm at Essex County College in Newark right now, which is interesting with Ros Baraka, uh, being elected mayor, uh, but I, they're telling me I have to do certain things, like they said, we want you to use a textbook. I've never used a textbook in 10 years as a college English professor. I find textbooks are awful, they're boring, they're decontextualized, and uh, all of the top minds in the field of teaching English say don't use textbooks, right? Now this semester, I handed in my syllabus, and I had the secretary look at it and say, that's not supposed to look like that. <laughs> Can you imagine, and this is something new, there's a, there's a growing authoritarianism afoot. So I had to redo my whole syllabus and make it reflect, look like a bureaucratic piece of shit that's boring and you don't even want to look at it. And, 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 the, and the department chair handed me the Pearson textbook. And he said, oh, he said, here, you can borrow my copy. And it, it's like weighs a ton, you know. You open it up, ah, can't use that. I mean, I, 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 I uh, had my, one of my greatest successes this semester by showing a YouTube of Amiri Baraka's poem, Somebody Blew Up America. And that got my students awake. And, Whoa, let's write about that. Let's talk about that. So that's, that's called context. You know. But how do you survive if you find yourself in a place? I mean, I started my career with Bob Lubetsky. I mean, that, that's a dream, you know. But now you go out in the world and you find places. And it's like a saying, war. There's I'm a sorry. war. Yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> but but David, I'm sorry, David. Yeah, but but so uh, you know, what do we have to do to survive in places and when it's very authoritarian? And you know, is, is it going that way? Are there liberatory spaces where radical teachers like myself can be above the radar? That's what I want. Um, so I'm not a teacher, I'm just kind of a concerned citizen, if you will, but um, I'm interested in uh, charter schools as privatization. privatization. And, um, so anyway, out on Eastern Long Island where I live, I wrote a op-ed to the local paper there where they did a, a, a profile of the new charter school principal. And I was cryptid my little socialist, thank good work for the year, and was critical of it. But the biggest response that the paper actually emailed me, so we got like the biggest response, everyone wanted to write about it, but it was all from right-wing yeah. conservatives supporting my position. And they asked me to then write again, and I, it was like the hardest thing I ever had to do, because the support was in something I agreed with. So how do like, we connect like two really disparate? Can I ask a question? Sure. What was it about what you were saying that they agreed with? Um, about Common Core and sort of the, the it being almost like tyrannical, taking the love of education away. Um, sort of, I don't know how they read what I wrote, yeah, yeah, yeah. specifically criticizing yeah. capitalism in a local paper, and supported it, and was like, yeah, he's right on, this guy knows what we're about. Um, but I was kind of wondering about how it's hard, or I just was very confused, I guess, to know what to do with that after that was the support. I don't know if I have an answer to your question, <laughs> but I think that the, this is a big question. I was on a panel yesterday where this was like a huge, People can feel the coming of these like Tea Party types who, you know, hate Obama, 
hate the federal government and therefore hate Common Core. And I just feel like it is fraught with danger for us, uh, to say yeah. the least. Um, in in the main, because for one reason, because the issue of racism is so central to this is going to be so central to this fight to defend and improve public education that to bring on board in some kind of friendly way people whose starting point is generally racism is like just death for us. Um, so I feel like, you know, as long as we stick to our guns and make clear what our stances are about, um, you know, I'm not going to like bar the door from somebody walking through, but I don't want our movement, as the New York Times often tries to do, is to be painted in like Tea Party colors. I, 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 I disagree with that a bit. You know, I, I'm sure stick with our, to our guns is the wrong metaphor, um, but um, uh, I, I think pluralism really is the, the great um, engine for uh, educational discourse. And, and, and so, uh, because I'm a big critic of the Common Core, I too have been picked up on, you know, I see where my name is used in, in blogs, some little sentence from some op-ed I wrote uh, on some right-wing platform. And, you know, fine with me. First of all, they spell my name right, that's good. But, but besides which, I, I, I think that we need to find whatever allies we can, um, even if they, their, their content position, their substantive position, is something that we abhor. The idea that they want to, to break up this regimentation, which, also, which often takes a neoliberal stance in terms of curriculum. Uh, you know, the, the Common Core talks about climate change, talks about some of these more progressive issues that the right would just bury their heads in the sand about. Um, I, so I, I think we have to be open to all comers and, and make the debate about pluralism rather than about a, a different curriculum. The, the right-wing opposition to the Common Core includes um, uh, a fear of curriculum control. I know they want they don't want like evolution. Uh, maybe it's primarily racially motivated, as you said, and and that's a guise for their opposition. But um, the the left-wing opposition um, talks about uh, social empowerment, but. Um, I don't know what that would mean concretely, unless you're talking about um, unless you're talking about jobs and the economy. So I don't know unless we're calibrating schools to the job market. Um, I don't know. This sounds awful, but I don't know what the use of having socially empowered people is. If there's no job market for them, we need to open that market. I feel like I'm talking a lot. That's why I'm hesitating. A couple things, uh, just to connect real quick with you. I mean, this is where history can be so empowering because if you know a little history, you know that Franklin Roosevelt created over 11 million jobs during the Great Depression, and this could easily be done again. Obama could have done it five years ago. But nobody knows any history. You've got these right-wing psychopaths. That's the only way we can describe them. Like, literally, anything he does is socialism, which even what Roosevelt did wasn't really socialism. But it was an attempt to make capitalism work. And, you know, Roosevelt, you know, his, his, the ruling class considered him a traitor to the class. But all he did was save American capitalism. But we could have done that again. So, again, that's where history is so empowering. Is we could create a new economy that actually works for humans rather than for corporate greed. And I also just want to address the brother from Estes County College. I'm Brandon, I'm from the Newark Education Workers Caucus. It is very difficult to create spaces for like liberatory teaching. Uh, you have to get a little bit lucky, I think. Um, for instance, I'm at a school that's a high level magnet where we have fortunately, you know, a lot of family involvement, a good PTSA that's really active. And I have basically become like, you know, or we basically made that building like the center of resistance to every form. But that's not so easy to do in the other buildings, you know, where they don't have that reputation or where it doesn't have magnet school status. Uh, you know, so it's very difficult. 
Uh, the one thing I would say is collectivity and really building bonds with your fellow workers is the, the way to do it, and that's easier said than done. I know some of the high schools in Newark, teachers barely talk to one another, and they, they can't even get two people out to a picket or something. But then in my building, you can. We can get you know 20 to 30 out to a picket, and we have a sense of solidarity. So it's really tough, but again, you know, if you find your union rep and help them build up you know, your, your little building committee and local, you know, then, then you can have some protection. Because if everybody refuses to do something, then what are you going to do, fire all of you? It's when only one or two of you are standing up that you're in trouble. Um, can I ask you, do you think you can still flip a switch and uh, make the economy grow in a globalized world the way you could back then? I don't know if we want to make the economy grow. I mean, I think we need to think of a whole new terminology. Uh, I think I think we need to be pr producing things for human need. And, you know, I, I almost, this is where I sympathize with, like, anarchists. You need less, to less time work. You know, we should be working only, like, 30 hours a week. We should be able to sit around and lounge around and read a lot. You know, and, like, you know, be, indulge our human needs. You know what I mean? And artistic needs and our whatever needs. You know, I think we need to work a lot less. We have too many people on Earth to have so many people. You know, we, we could literally be working 25, 30 hours a week probably. And we could be learning and we could be, we got to envision a new world. You know, that's all. Amen. <laughs> that's a question that we keep asking ourselves in our teacher training program is school, can schools be just or is there justice in the world? That, that's kind of why I was asking you that question about um, schools integrating into the system is that schools are embedded in the capitalist system and when you start um, thinking about system change then that's it's not about school reform it's, it's in the name of progression and growth and development that schools have gotten worse and worse and worse for, and more than equal. I think we need to in some ways separate the idea the question of schooling from the question of are people going to be able to get jobs and be okay because if they wanted people to have jobs and be okay, they could give them jobs and make sure they're okay. Like when the banks were in trouble, they just gave them money so they'd be okay. They could do that for us. We don't, the, they want us to believe that the link has to be through schooling, that you get it so that you're okay, and that you have enough money and a nice place to live. Everybody should just have that, regardless of what they do with schooling. And schooling should be a place where you can explore your creative and intellectual powers, and your, our collective abilities, learn from each other, and you should do that lifelong. Free. You should be able to do that as long as you want to be able to go to school. So there's a way in which we have to cut with and identify with the fact that right now schooling is a ladder that gets you, you know, better life opportunities in order to expand those opportunities for people. And so we want to fight with people who are trying to get those opportunities to expand them, but in but also put the don't let the wealthy off the hook for not paying taxes, for not um, redistributing wealth in a way that would allow people to live and have housing and healthcare and all the things we desperately need. So there's a way in which through schooling they put that back on the individual that we can't allow. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, great presentation, thank you. Uh, just a, a, a quick comment of, uh, about uh, the, the working hours, etc. You know, Galbraith wrote about it in, in, in uh, the, I, I'm trying to think of the name of the book, 40 years ago about the fact, or 50 years ago, about the fact that there was no need for people to work eight hours a day already. The technology was there. There's, there's nothing, you know, there was no, re, no, they changed from 12 to eight hours, <laughs> what, 100 years ago. Yeah. So now there's no reason we why anybody has to work eight hours. The technology is there, but it's, the, the thing I guess I would really want to get at with is, it, it is because the culture which is the, 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 the conversation in the culture is determined nowadays by media, essentially. And the, when you think about, as I said, Murdoch owning Pearson and, and owning endless amounts of media, they're controlling what people talk about. So you got to name the villains. And I think that's a piece of it as opposed to just up, up, up in the abstract, oh, well, this happens now, we have to do something about this happening. This doesn't happen by accident. God didn't do it. Some corporate CEOs around the world are doing it. So you got to name them. Mm, amen. I mean, I, I think Brian's point and the last point are, are very important. The, this whole accountability movement, which I guess the word really hasn't been 
used, but that's you know the, the trope that's used, is because people have decided that education is for work. And if we delink education from preparation for a job to preparation for personal and collective fulfillment, then it's not about the test score anymore. It's not about the, the number because you can't measure that level of fulfillment coming out of the elementary, middle, and high school. So whatever that, that school organization looks like. So I, I think that probably is a fundamental change that we have to go through in our own thinking. Uh, Richard Boston wrote an article about 10 years ago, kind of history of a nation at risk. And one of the things that sticks with me from that article is he said that an Indian engineer gets paid a sixth as much at that time as an American engineer. So the notion that we could educate people to be six times as good as an Indian engineer <laughs> makes no sense. And that, you know, talking about what mattered is comparative price of labor. And in fact, some of the most skilled jobs are less protected because they're quite portable internationally. I mean, this is just sort of part of delinking. I think this is very important that this whole thing that you're going to make it because you get educated in the global economy, which I see in all the schools I go to, educating people for the 21st century economy, that's really important to make people think about what, the, what, what kind of sense that makes up. And one of the things that Rossing points out is that this was done, you know, when the Japanese economy was riding high, so they wanted to turn American into right. Japanese schools. Pretty much directly after that, the Japanese economy went into a plum, which has gone for quite long. The school systems didn't change. In fact, American productivity went up in the workplace in the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so the whole putting this together is actually makes no sense. And it is important to reinvigorate the notion of education in the many ways that people describe it. I just want to leave the question. Do we need a paradigm shift? Let's think about it. And let's create that paradigm. Because according to what you said, that education to put people to work in the jobs that are already created, <coughs> that's a mechanistic way to perpetuate the system. <laughs> but isn't that, isn't that maybe what we kind of have to do specifically? I mean, if I think about the people sitting on the board of my college, the, I, the rhetoric or the argument that we need to educate people to be fulfilled citizens, they just don't care about that. They do care about creating workers and educating people who are employable. So I don't want to, like with you, like we need, I don't want the economy to keep growing and growing and growing. I, I want, like, work four hours and sit on my body the rest of the day and leave. I want my students to be able to do that too. But like like do we have this like like what about for instance like this idea of service learning? Do you educate people to apply the concepts of like what they what they do in a liberal arts education, critical thinking, and then they put it to work in a useful fashion in the economy. It's kind of like, yeah, this has an economic value. I don't believe in the economy I am reproducing and sustaining, but it also might like from the through the back door, like enable us to like screw the system, something like that. Um, and and it's it, it's insincere, but so what? Like I don't know. If that's the question. I don't know. Well, here I think actually Bowles and Gintis are again right on the money, because their whole argument is that there's no way to create kind of prefiguring model that's then going to grow and replace this economy. That the key to the whole situation is what we learn in the context of fighting for what we need. Whether it is even something that's still within <coughs> the paradigm of capitalism, like fighting to expand the opportunities to go to school or what have you. In the course of doing so, we have to try to overcome divisions between us. We learn about our collective powers and potentials, and that's when we start dreaming bigger. And maybe start thinking outside of the paradigm. Like, wow, if we can win this little thing, maybe we could win bigger things as well. So the whole, the, that's why I'm saying I think if there's a way in which we have to understand the long game, the big picture of, of that we want to dream different dreams and, and open up a future to other possibilities, 
but at the same time still be able to connect with people who are trying to get a better shake from this paradigm as it is. And that that fundamental impulse of people is right on the money, and we can go with it along the way to bigger and better things. Like, yes, we want improvements right now. We want smaller class sizes right now. We want to tax the rich so that everybody can go to school for free all the way up to PhD right now. And then along the way, the, the kind of struggle that's going to require of us to get any of those things is really going to be a, the kind of struggle that unleashes other social possibilities in the imagination of, of all of us. And that's part of the reason the rich don't are so stingy and don't want to give us even little things because they don't want to set the precedent that we decide anything or that we're worth anything or that we get to have a say in anything. And once they are worried that if we take an inch, we will take a mile. And that is the dynamic that fundamentally we, I think, want to try to set in motion. We're actually out of time, guys. We are. <laughs> Thank you so much for Brian. Yeah. <laughs> if you live in New York City.